All right, because it's actually exciting stuff today. We're going to get to Tartaglia's formula for solving cubic equations. And what's exciting about it is, number one, it's a very pretty, pretty formula. And number two, it is the birth of complex numbers. So let's try and get to it today. And let's begin with some of the basic things about solving polynomial equations. Some things that are more or less obvious, and then some others that are not. And then yet another fact that was a matter of much debate, and finally settled to become the fundamental theorem of algebra. So, here is, I would say, an obvious fact, number one, that if we have a root of a polynomial equation, we can factor out x minus r. So, let's write this down. So, if r is a root of p, then p of x can be represented as the product of x minus r times another polynomial of x. We'll call it q. And an interesting question is, well, is this obvious or not that this is possible? It's actually highly non-trivial if you think about the operations that are involved. And you might not even know how to do that if this was given to you cold. By the way, I have to note that the degree of Q is one less than the degree of P. Polynomials have degrees, right? Not orders. Degree of a polynomial. Yes. So, the degree of Q, because of this factor of X, is one less than the degree of P, which is very important. And I believe this is called Descartes' remainder theorem, although it's usually worded in a slightly different way. And I do kind of think that it's obvious. Because if you think about dividing P of X by this factor X minus R, whatever number you choose for R, it doesn't even have to be a root. What will happen if you pursue long division is you'll end up with a remainder. And the order of the remainder is always less than the order of the polynomial you're dividing by. Just like if you were to do long division with numbers, and you're dividing by 7, the remainder will be less than 7. Because if it wasn't less than 7, you could keep dividing. So similarly, when you're doing long division of polynomials by x minus r, who has done long division of polynomials in school? Okay, everybody. Who has totally forgotten it, how to do it? Okay, fair enough. But you can do it. So if you were to pursue long division by x minus r, you'll end up with the remainder. And the order of the remainder will be less than the order of this divisor. And so it would be a constant term. So I'll just write plus c. That's what it would be if r was not a root. But if r is a root, then by plugging in r into p, we get 0 here. That's the whole point, that we get 0 when we plug it into this factor r minus r is 0. So if we want 0 equals 0 plus c, then c must be 0. So it's pretty much telling us that the remainder, when you do this long division, is 0. So I guess that what's not trivial about this statement is the fact that there is this procedure of long division. If that procedure was not available, then I would have maybe no idea how to do it. I could probably do it with a linear equation, with a system of linear equations by letting the coefficients of q be unknown, and then I would write q out and multiply this out and match up the coefficients of what I get there to the coefficients of p, and start solving it as a linear system of equations, and then I would have to prove to you that that matrix is always invertible, and you, I probably could prove it, but it would be involved. Uh, doing long division is essentially inverting that matrix, but in a very smart, bootstrapping sort of way, in a very efficient way. So, I think, given that that's available, this is a pretty straightforward statement. But it is an amazing statement, and an amazingly powerful statement, because from this, we instantly conclude that a polynomial of order n cannot have more than n roots. 
Because if it did have more than n roots, suppose it had n plus 1 roots, then we could factor out the first root, and then the second root will still be the root of the remaining polynomial q of r, so we could factor it out of that. And once again, there will be another remaining polynomial q, and we could factor out the next one, and so on, until we factor out the n plus first root. And when we multiply them out, we'll end up with a polynomial of degree greater than n. So a polynomial of degree n can only have, at most, n roots. And so, of course, the interesting question becomes, does it always have n roots? And running ahead, the answer is yes or no. Well, if you allow complex numbers, which I guess we're not allowing them yet because we're sort of rediscovering them. The answer is not necessarily. The most simple, basic, fundamental example being p of x. What am I about to write down? What polynomial? <coughs> x squared plus 1. Exactly right. x squared plus 1 clearly doesn't have any real roots because, need I repeat, if you square a positive number, you'll get something positive. If you square a negative number, you'll get something positive. And 0 would get you 0, so this plus 1 assures that this is always positive, therefore no roots. And since there's all numbers are either positive, negative, or 0, we've kind of run out of choices here. Again, do you see how I'm going around the possibility of complex numbers? So no, that polynomial does not have any roots. And an equivalent way of stating that is that it cannot be factored. Because if it could be factored, once you discover a linear factor like this, then r is a root. So saying that a polynomial like this doesn't have any roots, and saying that it cannot be factored any further into linear terms, are completely equivalent statements. Okay, so that polynomial cannot be factored. So yes, without complex roots, Without complex numbers, not all polynomials of degree n have n solutions, this being the primary example. And, and equivalently, not all of them can be factored into linear terms. Okay, so let's, we've, we've established that. Let's move on to cubic polynomials. And, something, and there's something, once again, completely obvious about cubic polynomials. And it's the fact that they have at least one root. And you don't have to be a student of calculus to realize that, although I'm going to draw a graph. But this, all of this predates graphs, if you think about it, because what everything I'm talking about right now is, you know, at the latest uh, 16th century mathematics. So they wouldn't draw a graph. But a cubic goes to infinity for large x and to negative infinity for very small x. So, so it, it could, would typically look like this, and now I regret having it drawn like this because I think I wanted to do this. That's okay, right? I just wanted to cross the x-axis x in one place only. But because it goes, because it's very negative for large negative x and very positive for large positive x, somewhere in between it crosses the x-axis. So if we look at a cubic equation, there is always one solution. And when there is always one solution, you can factor it out, and you'll be left with a quadratic. And when you're left with a quadratic, then it either has two solutions, or two different solutions, or two identical solutions. I think in both cases we'll count them as two roots. Or it would, could end up being something like this, a parabola above the x-axis, to use the graph analogy again. And there would no end it you could not factor it any further. Let me ask you a question. If you go to fourth order equations, where this argument no longer works, and there may be no roots, a fourth order equation, I'm going to make this messy, but that's okay, it might look like this, and never touch the x-axis, I could look at x to the fourth plus one as a simple example. Can you always factor it into quadratics. 
So with the cubic equation, the answer is yes, because there's always one root. You can factor it out, and you're left with a quadratic. So from that, you might get this wild idea that any polynomial can be factored into linear and quadratic terms. And so you go to quartic, fourth order, fourth degree polynomials, and you ask yourself the same question, and I think your inclination should be no, that that's not possible. Would you agree with me? Because there's such tremendous variety of fourth degree polynomials. Okay, that's very interesting. That was actually the intuition of very many great mathematicians. I've even read somewhere, and I absolutely do not believe this, that the great Descartes, I mean, I even feel ridiculous saying that, but I should do a little bit more research because I read this in a reputable source, thought that x to the fourth plus one cannot be factored into quadratic polynomials. What do you think about that? x to the fourth plus one. If it were x to the fourth minus one, then it's a piece of cake. It's my favorite formula. Difference of squares. You can factor it into x squared minus one and x squared plus one. And then x squared minus one, you can factor even further. x minus one times x plus one. You guys can receive these equations that I'm saying out loud. That's good. And so you have two linear terms and this quadratic term. That, that's if this was a minus. But with a plus, legend has it that Descartes thought that this was not factorable. What do you guys think? Can you think of a clever way to factor it? While you're thinking about that, I'll erase this. By the way, I presented it as a grave oversight. You can pretty much guess that you can't factor it, right? And it's actually pretty simple. Does anybody know the trick? So the trick is to add 2x squared to this and subtract 2x squared. So you would write this polynomial in this form. Okay, and do you see what's happening now? This is a perfect square. Do you see this? It's x squared plus 1 squared. And so now we have a, dis a difference of squares again. I will skip that intermediate step, and so the result becomes... And so yes, this polynomial, at first sight you might not think that it's factorable, but it's actually quite easy to factor it. One sec. What did I miss up? Okay, I would say that this is rather easy, although it's never easy when you have to throw in something that's not there, you know? It's never easy. But I don't, but I think this would have been easy for Descartes. So I don't believe this legend. But if you find, uh, if you can find Descartes' writing where he said this in writing, maybe I'll believe it. And if it did happen, I, I would find this pretty comforting to know that some of the greatest humans ever could make a silly mistake. Because I make <laughs> all the time, so that would make me feel very good. Okay, so this could be factored, but that doesn't prove that any polynomial could be factored. So the question remained outstanding for at least another 150 years until it got to Euler. And one, and one very interesting episode, a friend of Euler's, Nicholas Bernoulli, I believe, wrote him a letter saying, I have found a fourth degree polynomial that cannot be factored into quadratics. And here it is. So he wrote in a letter to Euler, and Euler said, well, guess what? I factored it, and I'm going to write out his solution just so that you, you can enjoy it, and you can imagine why this was such an active debate. So here were his polynomial factors. I'll just write the, quad the first quadratic one. So this was one of the factors. And the other one is obtained by replacing this plus sign with a minus 
and this plus sign with a minus. Okay, so you can almost tell the difficulty and the amount of work that went into this. And the genius. So if you feel like it, you can multiply these two polynomials out, you know, simplify the terms, and you'll end up with this. Okay, so Euler was in the camp that believed that any fourth order polynomial can be factored into quadratics. And in fact, he goes on and proves it. And I was going to show you his proof, but I'll, I'll skip it. I think it's a little bit too far outside the scope. And then that also covers fifth order, fifth degree polynomials. You guys agree with me? Because being an odd degree polynomial, it has a root just like a cubic. And by factoring out that root, you're left with a quartic. And according to Euler's proof, you could do it. Okay, that's interesting. What about sixth degree? Okay, well, Euler proved it for sixth degrees as well. It was a different proof. I'm not familiar with it. And then for eighth degree. And then for every even degree, I believe he had a different proof. And then finally, he had a general proof for any degree. And so it became known that the polynomial of any degree can be factored out either into linear terms or quadratic terms. And that's known as the fundamental theorem of algebra. Because running ahead now, now you can imagine that we have complex numbers. And if we have complex numbers, then that shows that every polynomial of degree n has exactly n roots. Because when you look at that factoring, I'm not going to write it down, that every linear term yields a, an obvious solution just from that linear term, and every quadratic term can be solved using the quadratic formula. And you will get two, either two real roots or two complex roots. So when you have complex numbers, you state the theorem as the fact that every nth degree polynomial has exactly n roots. If you don't have complex numbers, you state it as the fact that polynomial of any degree can be factored into linear and quadratic terms. And those are equivalent, because you can't say that quadratic terms have two roots. Okay. With complex numbers, the theorem is actually a little bit more general, because you can also allow complex coefficients, whereas this statement does not allow for complex coefficients, the factoring way of doing it. That's a real valued theorem. Okay, and the amazing thing about this, also tells you something about Euler, is that I will show you, in not so distant future, an absolutely, I'm not going to call it trivial, because I never thought of it, most people never thought of it, but a very short proof, one line proof essentially, that makes it completely off, that makes this statement completely obvious. And it's just amazing that Euler who was essentially a master of complex numbers, totally missed that argument and continued his explorations and increasing the degree of polynomials to, you know, two at a time and finding these ingenious arguments to prove his case and totally missed that one. So it's quite possible that things are missed and the positive takeaway from that is that all of these wonderful discoveries are all around us left to be found and we just we still have the opportunity to find them so no matter how many geniuses came before you Archimedes or Newton or Euler math is just this great gift that keeps on giving and will forever keep on giving and will never run out of beautiful formulas